Hi everyone and welcome. Uh, what we or what I'm going to talk about here now is how flow works. I mean, how hard could that be? Uh, it's 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 just a framework and so on. Uh, but really, mm, the way we're going to do it is to see wh what happens when I click a button and kind of all the different steps that that go through that. Why is that meaningful for you to know? I mean, op optimally, flow just, it works by magic. You, you shouldn't need to know about it. It, it, it just, it just works and that's it. But in practice, every now and then you, you want to debug something or you want to really optimize something or there's, maybe you're just curious. There, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why it's still, even though it's not technically needed, it, it's still useful to really understand what goes on behind, behind the scenes. So what, what we're going to do, as said, see what happens when you click a button. And for this, I built this really complex Vardin application. It, it's, it's one Java class. I, I could have made it basically a one-liner, but I, I didn't because it, it didn't really fit on the screen and so on. But what we really have, we create a button, we add a click listener to it, we add the button to the, to the view, which in this case is in a vertical layout. And then when you click the button, then it runs a click listener that shows a notification. And that's the whole application, easy as that. The way we're going to look at it is through kind of what, what's the runtime behavior? What, what, what are the different relevant pieces of, of code that happen? Or I actually took some liberties of simplifying what's actually going on there. But but kind of from that point of view, I'm, for instance, not going to look at all about how this application is built, what happens during build time, what happens when the server starts up, how does the webpack integration work, and so on. I'm just assuming we have a, an application in, in a production build. It runs, kind of the, the server is started, it, it's in a steady state, and then you just open it, and, and then we see what happens. And we're going to look at this from three different abstraction levels. We have the really high level kind of component level, uh, which is from the point of view of what, what you see when you actually write application code. Then in between, we have the element level, which is the low level way that you use, for instance, if you want to integrate uh, your own web components and so on. And then finally, we will dive really deep into something that is, uh, in the flow framework itself, it's named state node and state tree. And that's about how things are actually in a low level sent over the network to, to keep things in sync and so on. So with that introduction out of the way, let's look at the actual application. So when we open the application, the first thing that happens is we type in the URL in that address bar in the browser and the browser sends a get request to, in this case, just slash. So, so the root of the application. And what it gets back, it's almost nothing. I've simplified this a little bit, but it's basically, it's an HTML document with a single script tag and a sim single div in the body. And that's all there is to it. The interesting thing really is the script tag. It, it, it's this Vardim bundle thing that is, uh, for production mode, it's, it's built when you build the application. It contains the body and flow client engine that kind of coordinates everything for you. It contains the body and router that takes care of navigation. It contains all the web components that you're using in your application and a whole bunch of, of other things like the theme and so on. Everything is just mashed together into this single JavaScript file or actually split up, but that's an implementation detail. And what that does is kind of, it all starts with the thing that is in some index TS file somewhere. You would have this as an explicit file when you use Hilla, but with flow, it's, it's hidden away for you. And, and what we have here, the core of it really, is to configure the Vardin router. So create a definition of what are the routes in this application. And from the Vardin router's point of view, there's just a single, dot star root so it, it 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 captures anything that isn't 
it captures anything that isn't captured by anything with higher priority, which is where you would put your own heal up uh, views and so on. And what it does is that it simply delegates the navigation asynchronously to, to, to flow on the server. And then the rest of the index DS, it's basically creating an actual route or configuring to use the single one div that we had in the, in the page and, and then making it actually use this very complex root definition. So what happens with this delegate to server? Uh, what it does is uh, wh when, when the thing is bootstrapped, it creates a UI instance. Uh, UI kind of, it's one-to-one -one with the body element in, that is actually in the browser. Uh, and then it uses client callable, which is a regular Vaadin uh, RPC feature to, for the client side to be able to call specific chosen server side code. So we also internally use our own mechanisms for, for these kinds of things. And what the client, client callable does, it, it receives a whole bunch of other things also whenever you navigate. But the really main thing is that it, it gets the string that contains the, the path that we're navigating to. And simplifying things a little bit still, all that flow or this JavaScript bootstrap UI does when it receives this delegated navigation from the client side router is that it tells the server side router that, hey, now we went to, to, to this uh, address. And based on that, now we, we, we just went to slash, so it's, it's just an empty string here. Based on that, it finds from all the root annotated classes in the application, it finds the right one, which was now the, the only class in this whole application. Creates an instance of that, runs the constructor basically, and that does then all the things that, that we will actually see. And then it attaches that component to the UI in this case, because we didn't have any parent layout for it. And, and then magic happens. I mean, it, it's almost as easy. Of course it isn't. Uh, one kind of step beyond this is how it actually happens, because this client callable thing that is invoked through, uh, it happens through an HTTP request. So when the client engine calls that function that is exported somehow, what actually happens is that the flow client engine sends a request to the server with whatever parameters was passed there. So basically the, the, the address and, and some other stuff. And that gets into this UIDL request handler. UIDL, it's probably the oldest thing we still have in Vaadin. It's really from the very first version of Vaadin. It's UI definition language. What it actually means or what it actually looks like has changed throughout the years, but it's still the same central concept that UIDL, that is what describes how this client side state should change based on what has happened on the server. So we get this UIDL request and to handle it basically finding from the server session, finding the UI that this order is from just ba based on an integer ID and then handle all the RPC calls in this request that we have, which was the client callable, the, the thing that just navigates. And then the magic really, it's write UIDL. So it, it, the UI internal keeps track of everything that has happened in the whole component tree, all its children, and everything that's happened since the last time, which in this case is since it was created at all, is written out into the response. Then the client engine receives that response and can update things. So then we actually get to this almost. We actually, we have run the constructor for the view. We created a button, we added it there and, and configure it and so on. And, and then we, we see this. Now, what happens when we click this button is again, the client engine, it knows that there's a click listener for this button. It doesn't know what the click listener would do, but it, it just knows that when clicks, when they click events from this button, then we should send them to the server. So that is sent as this kind of JSON. It says that, hey, we have an event here, kind of a DOM event. It's from node with ID five, which is the generated ID that this button happened to get. It's a click event. 
and then it's got a bunch of data kind of was the shift key pressed which mouse button was was clicked where, where on the mouse was this thing and so on and then based on that the button component receives this raw click calls its own click listeners and the only click listener that it had was the one from the application that says that let's show a notification that e again yeah, it uses UI get current to actually find the UI that the notification attaches itself to. And then this string, this thing also goes to the same exact UIDL request handler. So it's it was an RPC that we handled in this case, dispatching this click event. And then once that is run, it again collects a diff. What are all the things that have changed and sends that back as rendering instructions? that the client engine receives in the HTTP response and uses that to actually update what's on the screen. So what you get is, as expected, now the notification is also shown. Easy as that. Except that this isn't all the things there is. Because Flow, kind of the client engine of Flow, it knows nothing about components. All it knows about is these DOM elements. Like we have HTML, we have the body, we have the div. Those were there from the beginning. Then we have some flow container root, something, something that's created by, by the router. Then we have our own vertical layout with a theme and styles and so on. We got the Vadim button and we, we got the content inside it. But from flow's point of view, these are just generic DOM elements. It doesn't matter if it's a div or a Vadim button or whatever. In this simple example, all that we're doing is just using this DOM element point of view. For, for, for more complex components, like for instance, lazy loading data in grid, it also uses a bit of custom component specific JavaScript that we're not going to look at. But for all these simple cases, it's just DOM elements throughout. And the way this works is if you look Again, there's a couple of intermediate steps that I have skipped here. So simplifying a little bit, what the vertical layout component has. It's a Java class extends component, and it's got this at tag annotation, which tells what is the tag name that should be in the corresponding browser side element. And for instance, when we add a child to this vertical layout, what actually goes on in server side flow is that it gets the element representation of this vertical layout component, basically just a DOM element. And then it appends as a child element of that, the, the element of the actual child component we added. So in this case, the button. And then Flow takes care of synchronizing this DOM representation out to the browser. So it sees that, okay, we should create a button element and we should add it as a child or append it as a child to this other DOM element. Correspondingly, the button, it's also a component. It has a different tag. When we set the text of the button, which is basically what the shorthand constructor that I used did, it first removes all other children of the element. And then in this case, it creates a text node, a DOM node basically, and appends that, which also, for instance, means that if we change the text, it, it, it only needs to change the text node. It doesn't need to find anything else. This text node, what create text returns here also, it gets its own ID, which means that, that it can kind of be the target of changes from the server. When we add an event handler, it's exactly the same principle. So in, in the body button, adding a click listener, there's a whole bunch of uh, reflection going on here also just to give you a possibility of, of doing things conveniently. But what it boils down to is looking at the click event class that you're adding a listener for, finding what's the event name, the DOM event name here. So it, it's just click. And then we actually again get the element counterpart on the server side and add an event, event listener to it. This again, it just configures the client to know that it should send 
DOM events with, with the event name, name click back to the server. If you skip the Lambda for a while, then it also again reads the, with reflection, the click event uh, constructor parameters to find these event data definitions that defines what are the additional things that should also be sent to the client. So this is how it knows that it should look for the, is, is the shift key clicked and, and what's the X and Y coordinates and so on. And then finally, the actual event listener, it again, it receives the raw click event that contains this metadata in basically just as a, as a map of, of string key values. And then it creates a proper click event instance of it. And then it just directly calls that on the actual listener instance that we passed there. And that's from a kind of component point of view, how, how event handling happens. Because then when we get the request, again, based on the ID, find the element counterpart, it finds the event listeners one of these event listeners, usually the only one, is the one that then delegates to the application level uh, click listener implementation with, again, a click event instance instead of just a raw DOM event. But again, this is not, it, it would be good if, if this would be the case, but the actual communication protocol, it knows nothing about even DOM elements. All it knows about is something even more abstract. These are the, this is the state tree. It's made up of nodes where every node it has an ID. So the vertical layout has ID six, just kind of in the order they were created or attached. And each of these state, state nodes, uh, usually most of the state nodes, each one represents a different DOM element. But there's nothing that says that a state node must be a DOM element or only about DOM element things. So for instance, uh, when the application is bootstrapped, a bunch of metadata such as the push configuration, that's also passed through a state node, which also kind of gives, gives the thing that whenever any config, for instance, the push configuration, when it changes, then it can use the same mechanism for sending changes to the client as is used when you show a notification or something. So what this state node actually has, uh, one moment. Mm. A state node always has a bunch of, uh, they're called features in the, in the code that are kind of, it, it's diff different just aspects of, of configuration for this state node. So one is element data, which is an object. O o all of these features, they're either objects or kind of key value maps, or then they are lists of values. So we have element data, which is just an object containing, among other things, what's the tag name. We got the element children, which is a list that contains basically just the IDs of other state nodes that represent the children of, of this vertical layout in this example. And then attributes, that's a separate uh, key value map, the style properties, a key value map. If, if we would have configured properties, kind of get element dot set property, then that would be yet another feature here and so on. And then the way things are set up is that for this element instance, there's a binding strategy instance in the client engine. And what this binding strategy instance does is that it listens, it, it observes this particular state node instance for changes. And for instance, if if the element children list, if, if the item is removed there, then this uh, binding strategy, it gets an event for that. And then it sees that, oh, we should remove our, this child element from this DOM element. Correspondingly, if something is, if a new value is put into the element, element attributes map, then again, it reflects the same thing into, into the actual DOM, DOM node to add an attribute to that element that it corresponds to. And Kind of the magic here is what happens when we add things to the element children list. Because then it sees that, hmm, is this now, this state node, does it have an element data with a tag? In that case, it creates a DOM element, like a Vardin button, 
and a new binding strategy instance that listens to all the changes for node ID 5 and applies all those changes to the binding button element. But correspondingly, if the node ID, as happens with the child of the button, which is the text node, if it instead has a text node feature, then it creates a different kind of binding strategy implementation that instead has a text node in the DOM and that one just listens to this text uh, value change and if that changes then it changes the the text in the DOM node. And then finally uh, an interesting example is element listeners. So for click we have this F8 O C T N whatever and uh, that doesn't mean anything. It's just a, a reference into something that is called a constant pool. So that contains a constant with the same ID. And this then is an object that is what's the, what's the aggregate configuration for all the server side click listeners for this, uh, for this particular element. So in this case, it's kind of, well, yeah, for event shift key, uh, false is just a placeholder saying that there's no special configuration, but event.shift key should be sent onto the server when an event happens and so on. So based on this, the first time, or when a click entry is inserted into this element listeners map, then the client engine creates a DOM listener for that ele element. And then when that listener actually gets an event, then it looks at this, uh, this configuration to know exactly what to extract and how to deal with it and, and what to send over to the server. The point with this is just to reuse because uh, every single button has exactly the same configuration for its click event in typical cases. So in this way, this JSON configuration only needs to be sent once. Then if you look at what's actually, actually, actually sent over the network, what you see is a long list of change objects like this. So what this means is, well, we create a node with ID6, feature number zero, which is the element data, into that one we do a put operation with the key tag and the value of our vertical layout, and then correspondingly all of these. And what this means is that on the network, it's almost exactly the same thing regardless of whether you're setting an element attribute or setting a property or adding a, an inline style or anything. The format is exactly the same. The only difference is which state node ID does it go to and what's the node feature ID. So three here is element attributes and 12 is element style properties. And then for lists, instead of puts, we have splice operations. So basically at this in index, add these nodes, maybe remove these nodes. In this case, we're just adding a single child. We're not removing anything. And in that way, all, all, all the kind of, all the operations look the same on the network. And in that way, we actually, the network layer, it's, it's really, it's not that much code actually, but it's very, very flexible. It can do all these different kinds of things just by mapping things to different node features. So that's it. I told you it would be easy, didn't I? We've got three different layers of what happens when you click a button on actually also how do we get that button even on the screen. We got the component level. How do re request response cycles go? Always something is triggered on the client. It sends a request and then in the response, it typically runs some application code that updates the UI state and then these changes to the UI state, they are sent back in the, in the corresponding HTTP response and then the client engine receives those and applies them. Then we have the element level, which is how, how things that you see are actually manipulated from your server side Java application logic. And that's always by either mapping through element manipulation, setting properties, adding children, adding event listeners, and so on. Or then in some cases, the more advanced cases, instead just by directly executing integration-specific JavaScript code. And then finally, we have the state node level. This is an abstraction for synchronizing state changes between the server side and the client side, and how the client then, when it receives those, those changes, 
how it knows what to actually update, for instance, for DOM elements, which is the typical case. That's it. I've got nothing more to say on how flow works. Do you have any questions? Olli. I know that there's at least some things that don't uh, yet uh, show in this picture that you presented, like for example, uploads. Uh, is there something else that you left out for simplicity's sake? Oh, there's so much I left out for simplicity's sake. So yeah, upload, that's a special case because it needs to, uh, uploads can't go through the UIDL request handler. Uploads always go as special uh, HTTP multi-part requests that we then need to do a whole bunch of interesting plumbing to still hook things up so that things work. Other special things that come to mind, um, one is resource serving. So if you, no, actually that's about in a thing, connector resources. Yeah, we don't have those in flow anymore. Sorry about that. Um, template handling is a little bit special. So when you've got, it, it was more special when you had Polymer template back in the days and it had the template model. So in that actually, each object in your template model was also represented by its own state node. And that was enabled kind of doing fine grained in incremental updates to those also. But that's not that relevant anymore. But uh, another thing with template integration is the app ID tag or annotation. Because what happens then is the inverse of what I described. When you have a lit template, what happens is that it's actually, it's the lit library that creates the actual DOM elements. And then Flow uses a bunch of metadata to, after the fact, find the corresponding element that you have an at ID for and attach itself to that element. So for that, there's a concept called a virtual child, which is, it's a kind of a child node in the same way that the regular element children are, but it's not created and managed by Flow in the same way. Flow just attaches itself to it. And then for virtual children, there's a bunch of metadata for how should Flow actually find the right element to attach itself to. Then there's a bunch of special logic for shadow roots. Mm. Probably some other things also, but those are the main things that come to mind. So uploads, virtual children, and, and shadow roots. Any more questions? I see no more questions, so then I just say thank you and have a great day.